Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our leadership session, Innovations in Mobile and Web App Development. Uh, my name is Mohit Srivastav. I'm Senior Manager of PM for AWS Mobile. <laughs> and I'm here, in fact, with a full contingent of folks. And we'll introduce them in context when their turns, when their turns come up. Uh, in this session, we'll cover the breadth of offerings we have for mobile developers on AWS. Uh, we'll give extra attention to the features that have launched in the recent weeks. Uh, and drum roll, please. Uh, we'll give extra, extra attention to the features that are being announced right now uh, in this session today. Uh, after that, we have two customers coming on stage to showcase how they're using these capabilities to build truly amazing apps and truly amazing app experiences. Uh, in addition to this session, we have about 40 additional sessions throughout the week at reInvent, so absolutely attend those to deep dive on topics, anything that sparks your interest today. Uh, so with that said, we'll get started. Uh, we'll start with some trends that we observe in the industry as well as what we're hearing from our customers. By 2025, there's estimated to be an additional 1.2 billion mobile internet subscribers. Uh, these users, as well as the future users, spend on average uh, four hours a day on their, on their phones, an incredible amount of time. And their data consumption is going to increase 5x by 2024. Uh, this is driven in part due to the proliferation of 5, 5G. And it's also driven due to the fact just that apps are leveraging the cloud more. Uh, that said, there are challenges. 25% of apps are abandoned after the first use. And to the extent that you publish your app to the Apple or Google stores, you're competing with 4 million or so other apps for attention. So the question, of course, is how do you stand out? You know, how do you innovate? Uh, talking to developers like you, we hear questions that generally fall in these six buckets. Uh, the first bucket is around platforms. And there's really two questions here. The first one is, should I target mobile, like apps that are discovered in the stores? Or should I target web, apps that are discovered using browsers? And the reality is 80% plus of our customers target both. They build mobile apps and web apps to maximize reach and to maximize engagement. The second question then is what development approach to use. If you're building a mobile app, should you use native iOS, native Android? Or should you use a cross-platform approach like React Native? Similarly, if you're using web, should you do vanilla JavaScript or embrace a framework like Ionic, Angular, uh, React, or Vue? And the reality is there's not one size fits all. The next question is around differentiation. And in particular, how can I use AI and ML capabilities perhaps to introduce new user experiences that are not touch-based or to just make my app smarter and help get my users to success as fast as possible? The third bucket is around supporting different form factors, smartphones, tablets, even desktop, and how to enable amazing app experiences across all those platforms, even if network connectivity might be compromised. The fourth bucket is around security. And about 33% of customers have reported a breach involving a mobile device. And as such, security is the topmost concern, not just later in the app development cycle, but from day one. And the concerns here span robust authentication, things like multi-factor auth, as well as fine-grained access control, and in general, the principle of least privilege. Uh, fifth bucket is the data layer. And what this means really is the glue between your app and the cloud. And the key concern here is that it's instantaneous and supports real-time and asynchronous kinds of experiences. As well, it's really critical to be respectful of the device. <laughs> so devices often are constrained when it comes to bandwidth, uh, constrained when it comes to battery, constrained when it comes to, to CPU. And then the final bucket that really cuts across all of these things is time to market. We get asked, you know, how can I make sure I'm setting up a development workflow that's iterative, that it really embraces and acknowledges my organizational structure, doesn't fight against that? And then finally is full stack. I mean, increasingly, when you build a mobile app, you're actually doing a combination of front end and back end, not just front end. And the place we hear this the most is around GraphQL, where we have a number of customers where the front end team actually owns that integration layer between the app and the cloud. So. <clears throat> AWS offers a number of a comprehensive set of services across these three buckets to really address those questions. App features and platforms, developer lifecycle, and secure offline and real-time data. So we'll dive right into AWS Amplify. Show of hands, how many folks have used it before? Okay, 
more than last year, but still, not, still less than half, I think. Uh, <clears throat> so AWS Amplify is really designed to offer an integrated developer experience for building cloud-connected apps. It supports all the platforms we just talked about, and also want to call out for web, we go really deep and support Ionic, Angular, React, Vue, in quite a bit of depth. We, we go deep into those frameworks. Uh, the next key piece is the Amplify framework, and that's the open source part of the framework, which includes libraries, a CLI tool chain, and UI components. And the key design tenet we apply here is for these things to be use case focused instead of service focused. So for example, when you use the CLI, instead of saying Amplify Add Cognito, you say Amplify Add Auth, and then we walk you through kind of a Q&A session to then configure the under, underlying cloud services and automation accordingly. Both the libraries and the CLI tool chain work on top of AWS services, so Auth powered by Cognito, for example. That said, we've built the architecture to be pluggable, and in fact, for uh, our JavaScript library, for the analytics category, we support not just Pinpoint, but also Kinesis and Amazon Personalize. And then finally, we have uh, a developer tool in Amplify Console that supports the entire lifecycle of building, testing, deploying, and hosting the entire app, uh, front end plus back end. I wanted to call out specifically a few design tenets that we hold in Amplify Framework. Uh, first and foremost, it's proudly open source. In fact, it's, it's now one of the top five fastest growing projects on GitHub, thanks to contributions from the community and folks like you, and we really appreciate that. Second, the next three bullets are really speaking to the fact that it's use case centric, and as you use those use cases, it's best practices built in. So for example, if you do Amplify Add API, to add a REST API or a GraphQL API, for example, what we're doing under the covers is configuring IAM roles and policies that kind of adhere to this least privileged principle. And finally, there's escape hatches uh, built in. It's an area where we still have to do a lot more, to be honest, but it's, our, our, our principle is to have escape hatches built in. So for example, when you're using our libraries, if our libraries don't meet your use case, you can kind of go one level deeper and use our underlying SDKs. Right? And here's the full set of capabilities we support on Amplify Framework. Uh, the first two are new and the ones where we're going to give a lot of attention to today. I really, really want to be the one who gets to talk to you about data store, but unfortunately, that's not meant to be. Uh, in a few minutes, my colleague Richard's going to come on stage and really go into a lot of depth on Amplify Data, data Store. Uh, and the other, the other net new one today is Amplify Predictions. Uh, this enables you to do AI and ML use cases in your apps. Uh, we launched support for web and JavaScript a couple months ago. Today, we're launching it for iOS, and we'll dive into this. And I get the privilege of being the one to talk about that. All right, so we'll jump right into our new stuff. Uh, show of hands, have folks used the AWS mobile SDKs before? All right, good. So until today, the way you did native iOS and Android development on, on um, AWS is you certainly could use the Amplify CLI to provision your backend and to configure cloud services. But when it came to actually integrating those capabilities into your app, you would use the mobile SDKs. And the mobile SDKs are service-centric. So libraries for S3, libraries for Cognito. And in many cases, they're actually auto-generated. We don't even hand author them, they're auto-generated. Starting today, and with, with our, our launch today, the best practice now becomes to use the Amplify clients instead. And these take all of the design tenets we just talked about, learnings from JavaScript, and bring them to iOS and Android. So now the API signatures are use case centric, there, there's declarative abstractions, and the iOS uh, library in particular is now written from the ground up in Swift. It used to be Objective-C. As of today, it is Swift. And finally, we've built some pretty deep integration with Xcode and Android Studio. Uh, so if you're building a new app today, use the Amplify clients. If you have an existing app that uses the mobile SDK, they, works, they work together side by side. And you can onboard to Amplify um, accordingly. So quick code sample here. I want to draw your attention to the first line in particular, that Amplify Tools pod. So this is new, and this is something we don't actually do for JavaScript. So what this does is when you install this pod, it in turn installs the underlying Amplify CLI tool chain. So you don't need to do that yourself. And then when you start interacting with different artifacts, for example, your schema definition, uh, and then hit a save, and then build in your IDE, that actually kicks off an, an entire, kicks off automatically a process where those assets get built, 
the necessary amplify CLI commands get run, and if a cloud interaction is required, that happens as well. So it really, really integrates the developer experience into the IDE. Uh, so you can, focus, you can focus on that. The next net new thing today we're launching as part of Amplify OS is this predictions category I mentioned earlier. And it makes it really, really easy to add AI and ML capabilities to your apps uh, with no machine learning experience required. That said, if you are a machine learning expert, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, but if you, are, if you are a machine learning expert, you certainly can take a custom model, either one you've built or one you've gotten from a colleague, and uh, use that from your iOS application via Amazon SageMaker. A really, really cool part of Amplify OS is we not only integrate with AWS, we actually integrate with Core ML, and that enables some hybrid use cases I'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, here's the full set of use cases supported. Uh, this is based on feedback from customers, and it tends to be the use cases you would expect uh, for a mobile application, things like translating text, uh, text to speech. And here's a little bit of a high level diagram on how it works. So imagine I'm a developer and I call Amplify iOS translate text based on two things uh, based on configuration as well as based on network connectivity. That call will get routed to Core ML and or the underlying AWS service, which in this case would be Amazon Translate. And then we're able to provide a union of results that have the highest accuracy. So this lets you really you know, toe a line between offering the highest accuracy when it comes to the prediction versus the lowest latency, where maybe it makes sense based on network connectivity to do local, local inference instead of cloud inference. We've launched a bunch of other stuff in the last few weeks and months. I'm not going to call out all of them. The main one I want to draw your attention to is this amplify pull command, which makes it easy for developers to work in teams and pull down updates from each other. So imagine the JavaScript developer working on a back end, they do amplify push. An iOS developer could then do amplify pull to pull down, to pull down the definitions for those back ends, and then run code generation, for example, to start working on the Swift application. And this is an iterative workflow, it's not a one time thing. So this process can kind of continue, and these developers, even though they're working on different front ends, can collaborate. Next piece I wanted to talk about is the development lifecycle. Uh, last reInvent, we launched something called the Amplify Console. And even though it says here it's a Git-based workflow for full-stack apps, until today, it's been a Git-based workflow for full-stack web, um, you know, web applications. Web apps that are static, basically web apps that are kind of static web apps, HTML, JavaScript, CSS, single, single page applications, that kind of app, uh, with Amplify CLI created backends. And we, we launched a number of capabilities in Amplify Console, simplified CI, CD, custom domains, atomic depo deployments. But it has been fundamentally around apps with web app front ends. We got feedback from you, from our customers, that you know, why do you have this console thing and the CLI thing, but they don't really work together that well. And that's a key thing we launched last week. So that's not new today, new as of a week ago. So now when you start using the Amplify CLI, Amplify in it, you add features such as auth, uh, you push, push to the cloud and then launch the console, you actually get insight into what's happening in the Amplify console. So you can see here there's a new tab called backend environments. It's aware of features I've added to my backend, auth and um, an API in this case. And I can click onto them to get further insight. So in the case of a GraphQL API, I can see the underlying DynamoDB data sources that are powering the GraphQL API and, and, and go to those consoles. For functions, we show you the, um, the log information. So what this effectively means is as of last week, the Amplify console now is a really useful tool for backends for iOS and Android applications, uh, not just web applications. Okay. And now I'll introduce the last part of our talk, which is actually the bulk, bulk of our talk. Uh, around data requirements. Uh, and a year and a half ago, so in between the two reInvents, we launched the general availability of AppSync. And that we launched that to really meet the data requirements of mobile and web apps, and we based it on GraphQL. So it's a managed GraphQL service. And we set out to solve the most pressing pain points we heard from our customers around data. So real-time collaboration, offline programming models, the ability to front um, multiple data sources with a single GraphQL API, and then finally, leveraging the power of GraphQL and the strongly typed nature of GraphQL to enable fine-grained access control. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of work here. So with that, I want to introduce my colleague, Richard Threckel, 
who's a senior engineer working on Amplify and AppSync and really the thought leader for a bunch of stuff that you're hearing about today to walk us into much more detail in Amplify Data Store. Thanks, Mohit. All right, let's talk about this data store thing. Um, so Mohit was uh, w going through a bunch of industry trends and things like that, but there's, there's a couple like specifically that motivated us to build data store. Um, the, the first bucket is like low latency messages to applications, and you see this all the time, like I have a chat app, I have a news story like some politician, uh, you know, doing something outrageous and everybody get, needs to get updated immediately, right? And that's just kind of like the modern day we live in. Everybody needs to get every piece of information immediately as long as they're connected. And a bunch of our customers, and we'll, you'll see some uh, later after me in this presentation, have built a lot of real-time apps, right? Like these could be shared experiences, AR, VR, geographical things, stuff like that. But what we started seeing was a big trend as well on the UX that customers would, would do. And that came down to like, you know, if I was going into a subway or in a geographically poor area, and, or, or even like I'm in, you know, Las Vegas with like poor Wi-Fi as I'm walking around to conference rooms, right? And we basically want to experience things like they are real time and just get those nice UX patterns. But the big problem with this in the application developer space as we started digging into this and even using older patterns that we had in our AppSync SDKs were mental models that developers did. And what's interesting, you know, we're at an AWS conference, everybody probably talks about consistency models and distributed systems, but the ultimate distributed system on the planet really is between the back end and the clients, right? And you have thousands of devices that are essentially sharing state and you need some concept of consistency across them. Otherwise, you're gonna get a, a lot of like wrong information or loss of financial data. And what developers really do is they think of this little box and they wanna put information into the box and usually we talk about this being a cache. Uh, and then maybe they wanna pull information out just one at a time or iterate over records and then bind that to some UI view. But the problem is when you start treating caches like databases, these mental models start to break down really quickly. And ultimately what most of the tooling in the industry does is it pushes all of those constructs and controls down to these application developers so that they need to think about policies for when they're online or offline, uh, then maybe mapping relational models locally on their devices and caches, evicting things. And, and it really gets messy really fast. So this is why we built Amplified Data Store. And Data Store's got a few key things in it. Uh, the first is it, it matches that, that programming model, that mental model, that's super important, to where the developers just think about their data in their store and they operate on it. So they update data, they query data, they uh, observe models, which I'll talk about here in a second. And when they do this, we take care of a bunch of things underneath the covers for them. So one thing is, from a network perspective, Data Store is powered by GraphQL and AppSync. And the way that we did that was interesting by introducing a couple of new resolver con um, constructs I'll talk about in a minute called sync-enabled resolvers. And this allows us to bake things in like delta synchronization down to devices for events that they, that they missed when they were offline and only get those updates to, to really optimize their network patterns. The other thing that we did was we leveraged the power of GraphQL by having a strong type system to introduce some pretty interesting constructs when it comes to conflict resolution. Because if you've got a bunch of uh, large cohort, cohorts of devices where you've got these um, really high concurrency rates to where maybe you're doing these shared applications, multiple people on a whiteboard, you're, you're gonna have conflicts and rights. And what people really don't wanna do is make decisions over the, these things. So we give you a bunch of controls to do this and some of them happen automatically. Well, let's talk about kind of the mental model that, that people do when they, when they use Data Store. So the first is across all devices, you model your data with GraphQL uh, schema definition language. So you have one data model that I say, like I wanna create this blog post app or something else, and, and I add some different fields on this that are strings, integers, booleans, all sorts of different scalar types. And then you run a task. Now this task depends on your environment. If it's a JavaScript-based app, it's going to be an NPX script. Uh, if it's Android Studio, we integrate deeply into Gradle now. Um, so we can automatically install all of this tooling like Mohit was talking about with a single command. Uh, we publish to CocoaPods and you can run these things. And we generate out of this GraphQL SDL strong typely, strongly typed classes for your programming language of choice. So in Java, these are gonna be classic POCOs. In Swift, this is going to be classes with some metadata attached. These are gonna be TypeScript classes, things like that. 
And then, from a developer perspective, all they really have to do is, is create instances of these classes and interact with the data store API. So you can see I create an instance of this new post and I call data store.save. I create, want to query it, I can query all items. I can also use a fluent interface that we dynamically generate on these fields as well. So like in this case, I'm gonna just pull back all posts where the rating's greater than two. Um, similarly, I can observe the models, but me as a developer, I don't have to think about distributed systems concepts. I don't have to worry about if I'm online or offline. I just operate on the data that I have knowledge of. And how does this work under the covers? Well, the first is if I, this is the data store architecture. And let's take this vertical slice on the left um, to begin with. What happens is those developers, they save objects and update them in using that uh, data store API that I showed you. And then at runtime, we decompose these models. And there's a bunch of techniques that we use. In Swift, we attach some metadata with protocols. Um, we use Java annotations at runtime with reflection to do this in, in Android. And we use some TypeScript constructs as well with a JSON schema to do this. But we create a set, effectively this registry inside a component that we call a storage engine. And then from that, we convert to the persistent storage medium of choice. So this is why this is a data store and not a database. So for instance, on web apps, uh, whether these are PWAs or things like on your, on your uh, laptops or, or other form factors, we use IndexedDB. If this were iOS or Android, we use SQLite. But it's a nice repository pattern so that we can change the implementation later, and, and customers can also change this as they see fit in the future. Interesting with this, just that piece I talked about, no AWS account needed. So if you're building a mobile or web app and you just want a persistent storage layer that you want to do nice data modeling cross device, you can use data store just like that, no, no account needed or anything else. However, if you want to synchronize to your back end and do cross application development, uh, all you need to do is flip a bit to true and your entire back end with AppSync, DynamoDB, even Cognito user pools, things like that is provisioned out of the box for you. So again, you're basically just taking application code and building your entire backend from your app. Now, Mohit talked about a minute ago uh, the amplify pull command that we introduced. And this was uh, another reason why we did this command, because in the past it was hard to synchronize GraphQL schemas across different front end applications. Now, I simply can add those build tools or even just use the amplify CLI from the normal terminal um, and build my model instances from my GraphQL schema. It will get published to the back end. Inside the Amplify console, a logical construct is created, which has some of this metadata, including the GraphQL SDL. Now, if I go over to an iOS or Android app and I want to use that exact same back end, I do an Amplify pull. I run a build of my Android Studio or Xcode project. It creates these model instances, and I operate normally. But if you can imagine if I'm doing this and I have that same back end, as I talked about, there's going to be conflicts that occur. There's going to be race conditions. And everybody, when they're dealing with distributed systems, works on these things. And we created two key things to, to, to address this based on our learnings of the past couple years. The first is the sync-enabled resolvers. And the way that these sync-enabled resolvers work is they are a new type that you can see the operation is sync. And they require two different data sources, two different DynamoDB tables. So in every AppSync uh, uh, API, when you're using this flow, we create a, a table for each one of your types. And then this separate table that acts as a journal of changed events. And whenever a write happens, we write to multiple tables and we use monotonically increasing counters to version all the objects. And then when you're going to do a read operation, such as a delta sync, we read from both of them. I'll talk about that in a second. The other thing is, since we're controlling versions in the service rather than making you write code to do this, uh, first of all, we can get nice consistency properties across the system where we have one single source of truth that's controlling all of these counters. The other thing is we can be intelligent about how we want to resolve conflicts when they occur. So we have a, a few mechanisms to do this. One is an optimistic con concurrency control where we use these loose versions on these objects to resolve or reject them and then pass the responses down to clients and they can run callbacks. The other thing is, even if there is a conflict, you might want to inject some business logic in that. Like maybe you had a moderator type system or, or something like that and if the user was in conflict but the person's name was Jeff the admin, let's say, let them win the write operation and, and actually submit it to the system and then the versions will catch up. The final thing is pretty cool. Um, if you've ever read about uh, 
all sorts of different data structures in the industry like operational transforms or CRDTs and things like that. These are pretty cool techniques, but they all have trade-offs. Um, you know, on one side, some of them don't have nice associativity properties. On the other side, they might have nice properties, but it's hard to scale them because you have to track state and actors in the system. Well, we use some GraphQL type information to get around this, and we, we provide a nice middle ground on a new thing called auto merge that I'll talk about in a second to tackle this problem. So the first thing is let's talk about that delta sync process. So with delta sync, I was talking about we have these sync enabled resolvers. It attaches these versions and these counters to every object and writes them to both tables. When it does this in your change journal, we group the items into what we call time buckets. And these time buckets are formed by the version as well as the type. Additionally, um, a ISO timestamp that we apply to the item. And then what happens is when, we, when the data store is starting up on the clients, they run a, uh, you know, a sync operation and it pulls and hydrates the data store from the base table. But whenever they're coming offline and online, they get a uh, last sync timestamp from the server. And then if they just want to get the information from their time bucket, the app sync service is smart enough just to pull from the change journal and, re and reply to them with those changed events. Now, if they're doing all these concurrent writes and they wanted to do something like merge their items if they had conflicts, how do we be smart about that? And this is where the auto merge technique comes in that we set by default on any of these data store operations. So um, what we have is when you're sending a GraphQL operation over the network, like I showed in that data store architecture, we're actually creating a GraphQL document at runtime and sending this. App sync is parsing this in a, into an abstract syntax tree. And then we can look at the individual fields on the items as they come in, even if the versions are in conflict. So imagine a scenario like this where I start with an item in my database. I have a, this is a dog named Shaggy. He's six years old and he's a beagle. But I can see already that I've got some strings and integers in this. Maybe I've got Booleans and floats and other data types. At the same time, I've got two clients that are gonna do a write to app sync. One of them is, is updating the age to 10. The other one is updating the breed to a miniature schnauzer. And we can see that these are non-conflicting fields even though the writes are in conflict and union the results into a merged result set. And it's the GraphQL type information that gives us this capability. The other thing that we can do as well from those clients is if you wanted to, you can apply conditional predicates based on DynamoDB operators like I could say, well, I only wanted to do this right under the construct where the age was equal to six previously. And you can uh, kind of add your own flair into that logic processing that's going on. So um, I'm just gonna show you a little bit of the de developer experience on this, um, not go too deep into a demo and make this a little bit bigger. So a couple of things here, I'll show the GraphQL schema here and then I'll show the application. So what happened was I started with, uh, let me make that a little bit bigger. I started with this GraphQL schema and I just said type task uh, as well as note and I added a model type and you can see I've got kind of this description, strat status, rating, things like that. I can make certain fields required or optional depending on if I like and, and that really matters for some of these languages like Java or Swift because some of them allow optional arguments to happen to be passed into, into model types and other things don't. And then the developer experience here, even if I'm not using an AWS backend, is simply I will pull in this data store and predicates object from my amplified data store NPM package, and I can start operating it immediately. Again, talking about that mental model, I really don't need to think about caches or anything like that. So if I want to do a save operation, I just simply do data store save and I create a new model instance, pass it in. If I want to delete everything, I can delete conditionally or delete everything based on predicates in my application. I even have this nice fluent interface like I was talking about before to where if I want to query, I can just get the, the tasks where the equality is done or maybe the greater than another operation. Similarly, we give this, these same constructs in Android Studio um, to where I, if I wanted to use the data store, I can just use Amplify Data Store and save. Um, I can also create builder objects. where you notice it only gives me the title because that's something that's required. So if I wanted to, I could just pass in my required options and either build it immediately or add on some additional things before building my, my item and submitting it to the data store. 
So again, we've, we've really tried to take the, the next step this past six months by not only giving you a comprehensive experience when it comes to uh, what we're doing automating from mental models on clients, but actually further integrating into all the languages and TypeScript systems out of the box. And I've got a session tomorrow to where I'll be going through this in a lot more detail uh, with some live app, app examples. So with that, I'm gonna hand back over to Mohit. Great, thanks so much, Richard. <clears throat> uh, so now I'll talk uh, really briefly about some other app sync launches. Not gonna walk through all of these, just gonna call your attention to two. Uh, we launched server-side caching uh, earlier in the month, top requests from app sync customers. And what this lets you do is serve requests from a cache instead of hitting your downstream, uh, downstream data sources. It can improve the performance of your APIs and it can also reduce the, the hit on your downstream data sources. Another feature we launched earlier this year, which is gonna really be a, a focus of the upcoming customer uh, demo, is multi-auth. And that allows you with a single API to support multiple authorization mechanisms. So like perhaps for certain use cases you want to authenticate the end user, and for other use cases you wanna allow any request, any request to go through. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna introduce Frank Sconzo on stage. He's a distinguished software engineer at Dow Jones. And he's gonna talk about how uh, the Wall Street Journal news planning app is using, using AppSync, and he'll dive into the multi-authorization uh, pieces in particular. Thanks, Mohit. Good afternoon. How's it going? Great week, right? So I'm a software engineer at Dow Jones. I work on publishing and edit editorial tools, and I'm excited to talk to you today about how the Wall Street Journal changed their news planning workflow with a tool that we built with AppSync and other AWS w services. Um, and that tool is called NewsGrid. So today I'll do a quick intro and overview of news planning at the Wall Street Journal. I'll share user workflow challenges that we uncovered during design sprints and do a brief demo of NewsGrid, a custom internal app that addresses those challenges. Next, why we chose AppSync. Our tech stack and architecture, a very high level look at authentication and authorization, and finally some conclusions. So Dow Jones is a global provider of news and business information. It produces leading publications and products like the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, MarketWatch, Factiva, and many other products. The tool that we built for the Wall Street Journal helps news staff plan content for our many output channels, such as our print paper, Android, iOS apps, desktop, and mobile web pages, video, our podcasts, and then all of our social media channels. So to plan and produce content for all of these products, the news staff needs to communicate, and they communicate a lot. Reporters begin the workflow, pitching stories to bureau chiefs. They submit those stories to coverage chiefs, who then in turn involve editors who review and schedule the stories, as well as visual staffers who create rich media for stories. The point is that for just a single story, there's a complicated matrix of communication. Let's see this communication issue at a much larger scale. Let's say that there's a reporter named Alice in Athens who proposes her story to Bob, a bureau chief. They develop it and share it with Carol, a coverage chief across the globe in New York. Then an editor, Dave, works on it too. Many other people get involved. Tweaking and adding value is needed. And we can easily have five to 10 people working on just one story. As we scale this out to almost 100 news bureaus across the globe and more than 1,300 staff, this web of communication becomes a really challenging game. And without a good collaboration tool, no one wins. So we spent some time doing design sprints with all these users, and we narrowed down their key needs. First, stories need to be private and secure. But once they're shared, they should be easy to find, but by the right people. Users need a simple audit trail of their stories, and they need notifications when their stories are updated or published. We discovered that 70% of our users' workday is spent just chasing down stories in many ways, phone, email, Slack, instant messenger, etc. So they need to communicate better. They also don't wanna be tied down to their computer. It should just work from their phones and tablets. And they've been forced forced to manage content in many different tools for far too long. So they just want a single tool. So we set out to satisfy these needs by developing a minimum viable product, deploying in short sprints, failing fast, 
learning from user feedback, and iterating. And what we built is NewsGrid. We used AppSync and services like Cognito, DynamoDB, Elasticsearch, and several others to create a secure, scalable mobile collaboration tool for the newsroom. So let's see it in action. In this demo, I log into NewsGrid in the desktop browser on the left as myself, where Cognito and Okta enforce two-factor authentication. And then on the right, I simulate Alice logging in from her phone in Athens. After login, I can see the award-winning test stories that I wrote, like developers rioting over whether Emacs is better than Vim. But we all know Vim is the winner. Next, I click the plus sign, and I create a new story, give it a cool name, enter my byline, and explicitly add Alice as a collaborator so that she can see the story too. She gets a notification and opens the story, and now we can both edit the same story at the same time. So she'll change the name of the story to Quiche, and I can see her edits right away. Now I'll make some more edits and categorize the story with some tags, Life and Arts and West Coast, and then Alice will see those updates as well. I'll set a word count. I'll add a compelling headline, real programmers don't eat quiche. Then I'll add some summaries. Real programmers don't comment their code. If it's hard to write, it should be even harder to read. And real programmers don't work nine to five. If they're in at nine, they were up all night coding. So now I'll add a couple pictures of quiche for my article, which will also get shared across to Alice using subscriptions. Once those show up, Alice can add some descriptions. And of course, this demo only shows two people working together, but it scales out to many, many users in our newsroom. Next, I'll add a filing date so editors know when to expect my story. And then I'll proudly mark my story about quiche as the most important article of the day and set it as approved. And that's moving it through a workflow to make it appear in the weekly view, which is what I show here. So in this view, I can drag and drop stories by priority, and I'll move my very important quiche story to the very top. I'll move a story on reInvent sessions, booking in record time to the second position. The drag and drop events are also managed by subscriptions. So why did we choose AppSync? I can't emphasize this enough. We built a prototype to start with AppSync faster than we ever could have by deploying and building our own services and APIs. And AppSync, as well as DynamoDB, Lambdas, and Elasticsearch, all as managed services, allowed us to scale that prototype into a production tool. Building for mobile, we knew we could minimize data payload size by leveraging GraphQL. With AppSync, the GraphQL API is flexible enough to support the unique needs of our React client, but also support our custom tools and our workflow. And AWS tools like the schema and velocity editors, extensions to velocity, client libraries, they all help us move very quickly. So let's talk architecture. NewsGrid is a browser-based React.js client for mobile and desktop web. We use Route 53 for DNS. Virginia is our primary region. An elastic load balancer uses a listener tied to Cognito to enforce authentication. And that's in conjunction with an IDP, Okta. After authentication, requests are forwarded to EC2s, which are spread and scaled across multiple availability zones. Node.js and Nginx on the EC2s either serve up the React client bundle, or they proxy requests to our AppSync API, or they proxy requests to some of our internal Dow Jones APIs. GraphQL queries use DynamoDB tables as a data source to retrieve stories, user data, history, and events and GraphQL mutations edit those same tables. With collaboration at the heart of our application, subscriptions are critical, and they send notifications to the React client. DynamoDB streams and lambdas sync data to an elastic search index, which itself is another AppSync data source supporting complicated search queries. We also queue up events for users who are not logged in using another lambda. And we also use Lambdas as first-class data sources to offload drag-and-drop operations from the client. Finally, our data is replicated to Oregon with our DynamoDB global tables. So let's now touch briefly on authorization and authentication. AppSync supports four authorization modes. We select a primary mode, and that becomes the default authorization method for the entire schema. 
In NewsGrid, our primary off mode is Cogito user pools. Now, without a session, no one can access the API. In the AppSync console, we'll configure the very same pool that's used by our ALB, and that API leverages JSON web tokens provided by that pool. Back in May, AppSync added support for multiple auth types, as you heard a little bit ago. So our NewsGrid users can access the API via Cognito, while our Lambda functions are leveraging AP, uh, the API using IAM roles. To support this, we set up an additional auth provider, like IAM, in the AppSync console. To expand this to the schema, we have to add annotations, like AWS IAM. And this grants our Lambda access to the story data type and the query as seen here. But this overrides the default auth mode that we set up in the console, so we also have to add Cognito annotation. And since, since we're adding IAM, we attach the appropriate policy as the Lambda execution role. Finally, we can also leverage identity with schema resolvers. This velocity template creates a DynamoDB put request. It extracts user identity from the context object provided by Cognito. Our username is nested within that object and can be extracted and then used as needed. But if the request didn't include the identity object, then the template can just return an unauthorized response. So while building our prototype and growing it into a production application, we were able to avoid large capital expenses. We didn't need to make inaccurate forecasts and guess about capacity. We just scale in or out as needed. We're able to build and deliver a secure application and very quickly. The balance of our developers' time is spent focusing on user needs and business needs, and we easily leveraged geographically diverse regions without physically crossing the coast. Thanks very much. Thanks, Frank. R really great demo and, and use case. Uh, also, some stuff we launched recently for AppSync is in the area of real time. So uh, this launch, I think, was a couple, month, a couple weeks ago, also mid-November. And we really changed the underlying real time implementation and the capabilities. So now you can use pure WebSockets. Currently, our real time implementation leveraged MQTT over WebSockets. We increased the payload size, so when you're getting subscriptions back, such as in that news application, they can be larger than they used to. Uh, we enhanced the connection and broadcast rates. Uh, we added much more um, visibility using CloudWatch metrics. And then finally, in the spirit of really being efficient when it comes to the utilization of the network, we added a feature called selection set filtering. So you can filter the result set of a subscription back before it arrives at, at the user, not just send all of the fields. And that helps manage payload sites. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to introduce our, our next customer, Alexander. And he's going to talk about how he used AppSync and really the real-time features uh, in particular, as you'll see in his demos, to enable live, lo uh, live location experiences. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you, Mohit, very much for the intro. So as developers, we are more and more required to build real-time experiences. Today, I want to show you how we at HyperTrack enable those things for our developers and make it possible using AppSync and Amplify. So let me step back for a second. Imagine you were to build live location apps that are aware of the location. Now, it is extremely challenging to handle, process, um, have all the exceptions covered and improve data, and then later on even make use of millions of live location updates. Now, HyperTrack makes it very easy. We're a managed service for your live location data, and you can track the movement of your business. Look, just like AWS is the cloud for your server infrastructure, HyperTrack is the cloud for your live location data. Now, as a developer, you can embed our SDK into your own app, and we give you data back in the cloud or through different interfaces. We also call them building blocks. So a building block can be either be an API, an SDK, it can be webhooks, or the views you currently see on the screen. Now let's bring this to life with some real life use cases of our customers. Redbus. Redbus is in fact the world's largest bus ticketing booking service with 20 million users. And they launched the carpool feature as, uh, as part of their main app. 
That's right, they not only have buses, as the name would suggest, but they actually allow users to share rides on their daily commutes. Now imagine you're waiting for a ride and it's super cold outside, maybe even in Las Vegas, and you don't know where your driver is. You really have no idea to know, uh, no way to know. Now, Redbus is capable of using HyperTrack to enable real-time features where somebody can pull up the app, look at the actual location of a driver, and get a notification that tells them when to go outside. So you never have to wait outside in the cold weather anymore. Now, as you can see in the tracking experience over there on the screen, a driver starts driving to the destination, picks up the passenger, and then checks in as soon as they picked up, and later on continues to the final destination. Now, all of this is happening through Amplify in the HyperTrack SDK. It communicates securely with AppSync in real time and gets millions of data points communicated back and forth. Now, this is just one example of a real-life app that is capable of using live location data without any back-end integration. And I'll have much, much more to show. Now, here's another example that's extremely fascinating. Seven Lakes. Seven Lakes is the leading SaaS provider in the oil and gas industry, and they built an oil pumper application. In fact, the world's largest publicly traded company in the oil and gas industry, ExxonMobil, is using Seven Lakes technologies. Now, let me paint you a picture of how this is used. Oil pumpers can go about their day to day and visit several different stations in order to service them and make sure everything is up and running as expected. Now, we track the time spent at a specific station and the time it took to get from one to the other station. So the actual oil pumper can go about their day-to-day -day job without focusing on making all of these things um, actually available through data. Now, Seven Lakes sets up millions of data uh, of uh, geofences throughout the day to ensure that they have all the stations covered that thousands of oil pumpers can go through every single day. Not only that, but having the real-time view as a fleet manager and knowing exactly where people are, they're capable of reacting to conflicts uh, in real time. So imagine there's an unplanned situation happening where somebody, uh, where, where something needs to be repaired. What usually happens is a team would need to wait for the oil pumper to arrive in order to complete their maintenance work. Now imagine you would know specifically where the location of every oil pumper would be, and you could look at the map and pick the one that's closest to the location, therefore minimizing the time and cost spent at the service station. Now that's a huge benefit for them. Now here's another example, as you can see, where we're using a single AppSync inst uh, instance, and we have a Seven Lakes application that is uh, multi-tenant. So we basically have an AppSync instance for our clients, and they have their own clients as well, all going through a single AppSync instance. App -sync instance. Um, I understand this is very hard to relate, but let me give you an example that actually impacts us on a daily basis. Deliveries. By the way, did you know that Black Friday sales collectively accounted for 7.4 billion this year? That's amazing. Now, I assume many, many of you would have packages and deals they made on Amazon and are waiting patiently for them to arrive in time and safely at home. Well, AB Career, the leading career and trucking company in Ontario, Canada, built an asset management application exactly for that. AB Career is a 39-year young logistics company in Canada, and they have uh, drivers on a daily basis. So the company went through digital transformation in the recent years, and they identified life location and activity users, uh, users for, for the driver data, and they have many, many different business needs to fill. As you can see over here, there's a map where somebody can look at the fleet view overview, overview and they can see all the life assets moving in real time. Now, a fleet manager can zoom in and out and look at regions or individual assets moving in real time. Now, AB Career uses many different building blocks, as I already said, we have. They use APIs to build dispatching. They use webhooks in order to react to real-time exceptions. And they have real-time views that they can embed within their dashboard, just like you see over here. And by the way, this is a React dashboard that also uses Amplify. So again, we have a single AppSync instance 
and it's completely serverless for us. And we're using that in order to power other experiences, different use cases that people have for tracking. Now, the neat part is that we are actually trying to give the benefits of serverless to our customers. And I'll show you how we do this. Now, the beauty of all of this right now is that we have a secure solution that is capable of scaling up and down based on the demand, and it's all automatically. It's pure poetry. But how is all of this possible? We have four key components in here, and I'll run through them very quickly. We have Amplify that we use within our projects in order to make sure that we have a secure communication established. It goes through an API gateway, and then from there it actually passes along to an app sync, and that app sync instance is communicating to a DynamoDB. Now with those four key components, we're able to build all these flexible and extremely powerful interfaces. Hypertrack is being used, uh, Fuse are being used by AB Career. We have Redbus using the SDK, and we have Seven Lakes using several components. Now, it wasn't easy to get there. For the next part, I would like to ask you to do something. Imagine you yourself were to architect your own life location platform. Think about all the complexities that would come with it. Think about the most challenging parts you want to deal with. You probably want to have something that scales up and down quickly. Less DevOps costs would be great. It should be extremely reliable. At the end, tracking is business critical for many people. I'll let you think for a second. And let me show you what we came up with. So we early on identified that focusing on the, uh, so the biggest challenge we thought would be focused on mobile to backend communication. How do you get that data from the mobile devices, process it, and make it extremely accurate? So what we built is an SDK that would ingest data into our in, in event stream ingestion. So that pipeline goes through a gateway, uh, makes sure everything is authenticated, and then ends up into a, a, a Kinesis event stream. The Kinesis event stream, in fact, is extremely crucial for this architecture. It allows us to decouple the core processing that happens later from the actual event ingestion. And that's key. So imagine you have all of that figured out. You have a lambda. It's picking up the data, uh, storing it somewhere. And then the next core component comes into place, the processing. So GPS data is really, really hard to deal with. There are many, many edge cases you have to, to consider. You want to enrich the data, most likely. You want to harmonize it, remove outliers, and so on and so forth. And our key job is to make sure that we are delivering extremely accurate data to our end users. So this is very, very important. And at the end, of course, you create a snapshot and you make it available to your front end. Perfect. We completely handle the complexities and the most challenging parts of our architecture. Or did we? Well, of course not. We actually missed a huge part. And truth be told, the next part was also an afterthought for our team. Now let me put you back in time. Uh, with a month left before our release date, we finally understood the full complexity of this architecture. Not only how to get stuff from the mobile side to the back end, but how to get it from there to the actual front end, to hybrid apps, to web apps, to mobile apps. Now during an especially busy launch time, our VP of engineering, Alex, he was sitting at his desk and he was trying to figure out what we can do. So he literally had his, left, uh, his falafel wrap in his left hand and typed into Google with his right hand, connect DynamoDB, React GraphQL. What came out was AppSync. Now we threw together an MVP fairly quickly and had something to show extremely quick. Of course we had to overcome certain challenges in order to get it into production and to really do it ex exactly what we wanted it to do. So let me show you what we built. As you can see, we start with the snapshots that we already saw before. Now, I want to mention quickly the, the number four. Before this, we had APIs, REST APIs, and webhooks available to our clients. They could effectively integrate with their backend and get all that live location data. 
But as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to pass along the benefits of serverless to our clients. We wanted to ensure somebody can build a location-aware application without ever touching the backend. So it was fairly simple, to be frank, if you look at the diagram. We used an app sync that's behind a cognito for authentication, and then we exposed the stream of real-time data into an SDK, into components, and our views. Now, all of that means with Amplify and all of these SDKs, you can all of a sudden have a live stream within mobile apps, hybrid apps, and web apps without ever going through your own backend. And that's beautiful. All right. So with that, let me wrap it up with the key takeaways. First, AppSync turned out to be this magical, magical puzzle piece that we didn't know existed. We were able to go fully serverless, even with GraphQL. We are also able to reduce our provisioning costs and reduce our DevOps costs to almost zero. Now, not only that, we also got easy and secure communication thanks to Amplify in all of our projects. Just like I said in the beginning, AWS is your cloud for the server infrastructure. HybridTrack is the cloud for your, for your live location data. And they came together in order to, in order to build an extremely reliable, cost-efficient, and robust platform for all developers out there. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Alexander. And thank you so much for attending. Uh, we hope that the customer, um, customer uh, parts of the talk inspired you to think about what you might be able to build for your companies and, and your organizations. And we hope the earlier part of the talk inspired you to dive a little bit deeper into our product offering for mobile, uh, mobile and web developers. Uh, we love to, you know, we're, a lot of what we do is open source, so we absolutely want your input and value your input. Uh, you can reach out to myself. Uh, I was the first Mohit on Twitter, so you can reach out to me at, at Mohit. And you can reach out to Richard, who looks like wasn't the first Richard on Twitter, with undef underscore, <laughs> undef underscore obj. Uh, so that concludes our presentation. Uh, we'll be hanging out. Uh, we'll be hanging out here for a few minutes and to field any questions you might have uh, after after we kind of close out the presentation. And uh, please do complete. Uh, please do complete the uh, the session survey uh, to, to give us feedback in the mobile app as well. Again, you've been a great audience. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much.